Are you preparing for the interview with a hedge fund firm? Then these are the top 20 hedge fund terms that you ought to know before going for that interview. Hedge funds are extremely specialized pools of funds that make large investments in single asset classes and therefore take literally like a controlling stake in many of them. And therefore, the expertise that is expected from the participants in the hedge fund industry is extremely sophisticated, very high finance and very, very analytical in nature. I'm your learning partner, Sushila Hariharan, and I provide content-centric, research-focused material on fund accounting, corporate actions, OTC derivatives, and trade life cycle in my YouTube channel. If you would like to know more about the contents, then do subscribe to my YouTube channel where I provide videos on these topics. Let's, look at, let's take a look at what is the first term. The very first term is accredited investor. Now, in every hedge fund, there are few partners. Sometimes there are just about six to seven partners. Sometimes there could be more than 25 partners. But who is an investor in these funds? An accredited investor is the term given by the Securities Exchange Commission, SEC, to an investor who has a net worth of $1 million and has a $5 million investment in different assets. Okay, so only hedge funds which have a very high level of sophisticated savvy and investors who understand market risk allow accredited investors to come and invest in the hedge funds since hedge funds are very high risk games okay played in multiple assets in multiple currencies in multiple markets it's expected that the investor has some bit of understanding of the risk that is involved while investing in the hedge fund and therefore accreditation is very important by the hedge fund before they permit an investor to invest in the hedge fund. The second term that we're going to take a look at is general partner. Every hedge fund comprises two separate entities, the GP standing for general partner and the LP, the limited partner. The general partner is one who manages the fund they take all they form the fund they decide the investment objective they decide the asset classes and they take all investing decisions for trading in in different assets in different markets in different currencies and even redemption of these assets so they run the operations of the fund this is known as the gp or the general partner of the fund the third term we're going to take a look at is management fees since the GP takes into consideration all the activities of trading, investing and exiting different asset classes, the general partner demands a fee called as the management fee. These are the fees that are paid by the limited partner, LP, to the GP, that's the general partner. Now, why do GPs charge management fees? GPs charge management fees simply for running the firm. Since the LPs do not take any investing decisions, and they are mere capital contributors to the fund, it's very important that they trust somebody who has the capabilities of managing the fund. These fees are paid, therefore, by LPs to the GP to manage the fund. Now, every LP makes separate contributions to the hedge fund, and therefore, every LP will pay a different level of fees. So it's a percentage of assets under management of each LP that is therefore charged. What is the fourth term? It is performance fees, a point of continuous discussion and conflict between the LP and the GP. So while management fee is paid mandatorily as a percentage of assets under management on an annual basis or a quarterly basis, Performance fees are fees that are charged by the general partner for outperformance. So every time the general partner and his fund outperforms the underlying benchmarks, for example, the benchmark could be S&P 500 or any other index. It could be a commodity index. It could be an equity index. It could be a fixed income index. Then the general partner will demand his pound of flesh for outperformance hey come on 
he's outperformed the fund, right? Then therefore, the general partner will tell, look, I have beaten the benchmark. If I've beaten the benchmark, you pay me the performance fees. If I have not beaten the benchmark, don't pay me the performance fees. And that's exactly how performance fees, also called as incentive fees in some markets, are charged. The fifth term over here is hurdle rate. Since performance fees are very, very high, sometimes they can be as high as 20% of outperformance. What are the hurdles that are placed in the limited partnership agreement so that the hurdle then becomes a difficult hurdle to cross? It's the minimum performance barometer. The hurdle rate is acting like a hurdle. So only if the performance exceeds the hurdle, then the incentives are paid by the fund. If they are not paid by the limited partners to the general partners. Okay. So all fees are paid by the LP to the GP. In the case of incentive fees, it's paid by the LP to the GP if the hurdle is crossed. If hurdle is not crossed, then there are no fees that are payable in nature of incentive fees. The sixth term is SOFA. As you already know, the USD LIBOR has been extinct now for quite some time. It has been replaced by SOFR, also called as Secure Overnight Financing Rate, which is the interest rate benchmark for US dollars across the world. This SOFA announcement is made for all floating rate instruments on a daily basis by the Federal Reserve Committee. The seventh term is hedge ratio. Now, this is a slightly complicated term, so pay attention to this. Hedge ratio is the ratio of what is the percentage of the underlying position that is hedged in the derivative market. Okay, so while hedge funds make investments in different asset classes, in different markets, across currencies, they may choose to hedge a certain percentage of that because of the risk reward ratio. In a perfectly hedge situation, the perfect hedge ratio is one, but you know, hedging every asset class is expensive and therefore hedge funds choose not to hedge all the underlying positions and they may hedge somewhere between 35 to 40% of the underlying asset positions. Eight, the open-ended fund. An open-ended fund is a fund wherein the investor can subscribe or redeem on predetermined dates into the fund. This is called as the unitization concept where the hedge fund announces the NAV or the net asset value so that new investors who want to enter the fund will enter the fund at the last announced NAV. If existing investors want to exit the fund, they will exit at the last announced NAV. The ninth term over here is leverage. Now, leverage is a very complex term because it is the most important instrument for trading in markets. Leverage means you are using borrowed capital. You're having your own capital. You borrow capital. Now you're able to purchase new assets, take fresh trading positions with this borrowed capital. This means that the hedge funds are known to employ a lot of leverage and because they're using so much of leverage the kind of exposure that they have in different markets tends to get magnified and therefore the value of losses that could occur could be very high due to this leverage the hedge fund pays money in form of interest cost on all this borrowed capital but the risk reward ratio tends to pay off if the rewards are higher than the cost of borrowing. So if the hedge fund is making more returns than the cost of borrowing, then definitely they should to undertake leverage. The 10th term over here is LPA, also called as the Limited Partnership Agreement. Every investor who has entered into the fund will sign a Limited Partnership Agreement because it will clearly mention what are the fees to be paid, what is the structure of the fund, how are the incentive fees calculated, what is the investment objective, etc. The limited partnership agreement or the LPA 
is the defining document of the structure of the fund as well as clearly elaborates the relationship between LP, GP and the sponsor of the fund. The 11th term over here is short selling for which hedge funds are known to be very aggressive in. Okay, we recently had this Handenberg research report which was released in uh, March of 2023 and on the Adani group and there were so many short sellers selling out these uh, shares of Adani group. So therefore, I thought of mentioning the term of short selling because hedge funds are known to be extremely smart short sellers. Short sellers means you're selling stocks or bonds without having an underlying ownership of them. Now you must be wondering how can you sell something that you don't own? Well my friends in capital markets this is entirely possible that you can sell something that you don't own simply because of the fact that you have ability to borrow them from the custodian or from the depository. The cover trades are initiated by the fund manager so that the minute the markets collapse after the short sell, they are able to buy back at much lower profits. Thus, they make a profit on short selling. The 12th term we are going to take a look at is beta. Beta is the measure of volatility of the fund. Okay, If the beta of the fund is greater than, greater than 1, then the fund is more volatile than the underlying benchmark. Let's say, for example, the beta is 1.6, which is a very, very high beta. If the index, this implies that if the index goes up by 100 points, the fund goes up by 160 points. But that's just a rosy picture. What is the dirty picture there? The dirty picture is if the beta of the stock is greater than 1 and the beta is 1.6 and the market goes down by 100 points, your fund will lose the value of 160, which makes your fund extremely volatile to market risk. The 13th term is the lock-in period. The lock-in period is the minimum period during which the investor must stay invested in the fund. They can redeem the fund only after the lock-in period. So this could be as less as two years. It could be as high as three years. The penalties are charged on the investor if they want to exit the fund, which is not a good sign. That means they are losing faith in the fund. And the hedge fund has already invested significant amount running into millions of dollars into the fund. What would happen to the hedge fund then? They'll have to redeem those assets in order to pay back before the lock-in period gets over. Therefore, hedge funds charge penalties on investors who want to exit before the lock-in period expires. The 14th term, high watermark. The high watermark has been ex extensively discussed on my own YouTube channel. Therefore, I'll provide the link of the videos related to high watermark on performance fees. A high watermark is the highest performance achieved by the hedge fund during a specific period of time Okay, and only if the performance exceeds the high watermark can the hedge fund charge performance fees again. So high watermark, if a hedge fund is doing very well, every year it will get a new high watermark. But markets don't run in a single direction. They go up, they go down, they go up, they go down because markets by their very nature are quite volatile. In order to beat this volatility, Limited partners have put in this clause in the limited partnership agreement that if the high watermark is there as identified and only if the high watermark is exceeded can the hedge fund put a clause for payment of incentive fees on the limited partner. The 15th term that we're going to discuss is investor allocation. Many hedge funds are also close-ended funds. Therefore, there is no concept of unitization. They will allocate the investments per investor. In a close-ended fund, there will be a lock-in period. The investor can exit after the uh, expiry of that lock-in period only. Therefore, close-ended funds have many clauses with respect to how investors have to pay the incentive fees. The 16th term. 2 is to 20 fee structure. I have already uploaded multiple videos on this concept. 2 is to 20 
fee structure is the most commonly accepted fee structure in many of the hedge funds across the world. This means that the management fee is 2% of the AUM, AUM standing for assets under management, and the incentive fee is 20% of performance, that is beating the benchmark. Sometimes funds have a structure of 2 is to 15, which means 2% is management fees, 15% is incentive fees. Some really aggressive funds. Okay, I just saw a couple of funds which are really aggressive and they have a 1 is to 30 fee structure. That means just 1% is on management fees and 30% is on center fees. Now, this is very aggressive. Why is this aggressive? Because that means the GP has to outperform. Only then he can charge a much higher uh, performance fees. Whereas in this case, 2 is to 20 is mostly very standardized. But in the case of extreme uh, performance measures, then some funds become very aggressive and charge fee structures like 1 is to 30 as well. Okay, so they, they actually take a cut on the management fee and they say, let's come on, let's just do an outperformance so that the fund can really get over there. The 17th term is a feed of fund, a master feed of fund is the common structure of a fund, wherein a fund that collects multiple investments from investors. Okay. And then these funds are fed into the master fund. Early on when I started my YouTube channel, the master feeder structure was what I had was one of my earliest videos that I had uploaded on understanding what is a master feeder structure. Okay. So it's investors give it to the feeder fund, the feeder fund then gives it to the master fund. So in effect, for the master fund, the feeder fund is like a limited partner. Okay. What is the 18th term we're going to talk about? The 18th term is an offshore fund. Now, in the United States, there are very severe tax regulations with respect to fund structure, fund taxability, and so on. An offshore fund is a fund that is making investments outside the country of registration. For example, if it's an offshore fund in the U.S. market, it will make investments outside the United States. Now, why would they do that? Because then they can avoid the taxation laws of the United States with respect to profits, returns, etc. So offshore funds are funds that are denominated in currencies which of the US dollar, but invested in assets across the world. Okay. The 19th term is fund of funds. A fund of funds has gained in you know, in, in considerable importance in the last few years, where a fund invests in other funds. This is also known as a multi-manager fund, simply because the fund is investing in other funds. And you might say, oh, what a lazy chap this is, because look at it. He's not even investing, he's not even taking any investing decisions on the direct asset class, but he himself is preferring to diversify and invest in other funds. This is not really true, because Sometimes the hedge funds may not have the capabilities of investing in direct assets in other countries or in other commodities or in other currencies. And therefore, they take the expertise of a fund that is well established in this and then they make the investment in that fund. So the fund that makes investments into other funds, also called the multi-manager fund, is a fund of funds. And the 20th term that you got to know is clawback. Every year, you know that the limited partners pay the GP, the incentive fees. But sometimes, higher incentive fees are paid. And when the fund doesn't perform well in the next year, the, in, the limited partners ask for those fees back. So this typically happens in um, funds in, in, in uh, different types of American waterfall or European waterfall structure, where the excessive incentive fees are repaid back to the limited partner. So the general partner actually pays back these fees or the LP claws back these incentive fees. It occurs during periods of inconsistent performance. Let's say, for example, the hedge fund has made investments into five different companies, of which three have been multi-baggers, but two have been underperformers. I mean, they, have, they may have exited. So the limited partner has paid incentive fees for those three uh, companies, for those three outperformances, but do not pay incentives for these two. But then they are making an exposure on all the five of them together. 
and therefore limited partners protect their interests as well as their expenses by saying that look if we've paid incentive fees much higher than in a considerable month you got to give us back that incentive fees this is called as claw back thank you so much for liking this video subscribe and share with your friends who are interested in a career in hedge fund and investment banking operation